This is lecture 1b, and this time we're going to talk about types of equilibrium constants. In our first lecture, we learned that when a chemical reaction reaches a state of equilibrium, then if you take the ratio of the molarities of the products to the molarities of the reactants, that ratio will always equal a constant, and we call that constant the equilibrium constant. Well, if a reaction happens to be a gaseous reaction and the reaction reaches equilibrium, then it turns out two ratios always wind up equaling a constant. When you have a gaseous reaction that reaches equilibrium, both the ratio of product to reactant concentrations as well as the product to reactant partial pressures equal a constant. So therefore, we have two different types of equilibrium constants that you could represent for a gaseous equilibrium reaction. The first would be called a K sub C or a KC. This is what we were writing in lecture 1a. This is the ratio of the molarities of the products to the molarities of the reactants. And it's called a Kc because C stands for concentration. And the units we use for concentration is molarity. So therefore, a Kc is the ratio of the molarities of the products to the molarities of the reactants. However, when you have a gaseous reaction, you may have an easier method of measuring the partial pressures of each of the individual gases. And it turns out that if you can measure the partial pressures of the reactant and product gases in a system at equilibrium, the ratio of the products to reactants always also equals a constant as well. And if you write a, a fraction or a ratio of the pressures of the products to the pressures of the reactants, we call that equilibrium constant a Kp. Here we're using pressure units to measure essentially the amounts of reactants and products, and we actually use the units of atmospheres when we do this. So if you take a gaseous chemical reaction that reaches equilibrium, and in this example it's hydrogen plus chlorine is in equilibrium with hydrogen chloride, if you're able to measure the molarities or the concentrations of each of the reactants and products at equilibrium, then that ratio will equal an equilibrium constant called a Kc. And that's going to wind up being the concentration of HCl squared using the coefficient of 2 and the balanced equation as the exponent, divided by the concentration of hydrogen multiplied by the concentration of chlorine. However, if you're able to measure the partial pressures of each of those gases at equilibrium, then the ratio of the partial pressures still equals a constant, but it's a different constant. It's called a Kp. And that would be the partial pressure of the HCl gas raised to the second power because that's the coefficient in the balanced equation, divided by the partial pressure of hydrogen multiplied by the partial pressure of chlorine. And so notice how we're writing these. When you use the brackets around a particular chemical formula like HCl, those brackets indicate molarities. So when you're using brackets in your expression, you're doing the ratio of molarities of products to reactants, you're calculating or demonstrating an expression for a Kc. If you're trying to determine or show an expression for a Kp, then the correct notation to indicate the partial pressure of a gas is a lowercase p with a subscript indicating what that particular gas is. So let's see if we can calculate an equilibrium constant from equilibrium pressures. This particular equilibrium constant we'll be calculating, if it's going to come from pressures, will actually be a Kp. So let's take another gaseous reaction, gaseous hydrogen reacting with gaseous iodine to form gaseous hydrogen iodide. Let's say a mixture at equilibrium is determined to be 0 0.40 atmospheres of hydrogen, 0 0.30 atmospheres of iodine, and 0 0.20 atmospheres of hydrogen iodide. Calculate the Kp for the above reaction. To do this, we'll need to write the Kp expression. As are all equilibrium constant expressions, it's products over reactants. And if you're doing a Kp, that means you want the ratio of the partial pressures of the products to the reactants. So this reaction would have an equilibrium constant expression of the partial pressure of Hi squared divided by the partial pressure of H2 times the partial pressure of I2. If we know what the equilibrium partial pressures all for, are for all of the different gases, we just plug them into the expression. So 0 0.20 atmospheres squared divided by 0 0.040 atmospheres multiplied by 0 0.30 atmospheres. All those numbers are two significant figures, so our Kp will come out two significant figures. 
And in this case, the atmospheres squared on the top cancel out with the atmosphere squared on the bottom. So we wind up having no units in our answer. And the Kp becomes a dimensionless quantity, which means no units. And the answer is just 0.33. <clears throat> now that we know that the equilibrium constant for this particular reaction is 0.33, and I've indicated it next to the reaction now, let's try something different. If a new flask at the same temperature is charged with 0 0.20 atmospheres of hydrogen, 0 0.30 atmospheres of iodine, and 0 0.40 atmospheres of hydrogen iodide, is the forward or reverse reaction spontaneous? So if you have a system and you want to determine whether the forward or reverse reaction is spontaneous, you have to calculate what's called the reaction quotient. That's the ratio of the products to reactants. And in this case, because we have a Kp value, I'm going to calculate the ratio of the product partial pressures to the reactant partial pressures. And that reaction quotient is called Q. It looks exactly like the equilibrium constant expression. It's just that when you take the ratio of the products to reactants for a system that is not at equilibrium, that ratio won't equal the equilibrium constant, so it equals a value that we call the reaction quotient, which is Q. So they've told us what the partial pressures are of all three gases in the container at this particular time. If we plug those numbers into the reaction quotient expression, we're going to calculate a value for Q. And in this case, the Q value comes out to two significant figures is 2.7. So what does this mean? We know that anytime a reaction is started, the reaction is always going, to pr always going to proceed to a state of equilibrium, which means the reaction quotient Q will eventually become the equilibrium constant when the reaction reaches equilibrium. So our numerical value of 2.7 is going to eventually become 0.33. What's it doing? It has to become smaller. So because Q must get smaller to eventually become the Kp, you've got to think about how do you make that number get smaller. And the way you make a fraction get smaller is you make the denominator bigger. What's in the denominator of a Q expression? It's the reactants. So you need more reactants. That means the reverse reaction is spontaneous. Let's look at another gaseous reaction. And let's see if we can write both the Kp and Kc expressions for the reaction 2SO2 gas plus O2 gas is in equilibrium with 2SO3 gas. The Kp expression would be the ratio of the partial pressures of the products to reactants. That would be the partial pressure of SO3 squared divided by the partial pressure of SO2 squared multiplied by the partial pressure of O2. If you want to write the Kp expression, this is the ratio of molarities of the products to reactants, and molarities are indicated in expressions with brackets. And so our Kc expression will be the concentration of SO3 squared, written in brackets, divided by the concentration of SO2 squared, multiplied by the concentration of O2. So any gaseous chemical reaction that reaches equilibrium will actually have two different equilibrium constants, a Kp and a Kc. And these two values are not identical. The numerical values of Kp and Kc are almost always different, but they are related to each other, and I want you to be able to see how they are related. So to determine this, let's write the Kp expression one more time, and then I want to try to see how this expression is related to the Kc expression. And I'm going to do that using something from our gas laws chapter in Chem 1A. When you have matter in the gaseous state, the properties of pressure, volume, quantity, and temperature are all related to each other, through what's called the ideal gas law equation. And that equation is PV equals NRT. So the partial pressure of a particular gas, which would be represented by P in this equation, can be solved by dividing both sides by V. And one thing to recognize here, if you look at the right side of the equation, we have N on the top, which is quantity of matter measured in moles, and V in the denominator, which is the volume measured in liters. What is N over V? That's moles per liter. What's moles per liter? It's molarity. So if I can simplify this, I can rewrite the N over V as a capital M, which is our symbol for molarity. And so therefore, the partial pressure of a gas is going to equal the molarity of the gas multiplied by R times T. So in our white Kp expression I have at the top left of the slide here, I'm going to take out the pressures of each of those gases 
and replace them with their molarity multiplied by R times T. So see if this makes sense for you. What's the pressure of SO3? It's the molarity of SO3 multiplied by RT, and then we have to square it. What's the pressure of SO2? It equals the molarity of SO2 multiplied by RT, and I have to square it. And then what's the pressure of O2? That would equal the molarity of O2 multiplied by RT. So I've made those substitutions on the above right. Now, if I want to pull the RTs out of that expression, I'm going to make my right side of my equal sign be the product of two different factors. In the numerator, I'm going to pull RT squared out. And the denominator, I'm going to pull the RT squared out and the RT out. And if I to just separate this into two uh, factors, then the KP expression would be this. It'd be the molarity of SO3 squared over the molarity of SO2 squared times the molarity of O2 multiplied by RT squared over a total of RT cubed. What is this? That is the KC expression for the reaction. So therefore, the KP of a gaseous reaction will always equal the KC of the gaseous reaction multiplied by some ratio of RTs. And in this case, uh, the RT squareds cancel out and we wind up having an RT left over in the denominator. And so it simplifies to one over RT. So for this reaction, the KP's numerical value will equal the KC's numerical value multiplied by one over RT. Or another way to write that is RT to the negative one. Now, depending upon what the balanced equation is, that little exponent above the RT is going to be different, and you have to see where that comes from. If you look at the equation at the very top of the slide, we have two moles of products in our balanced equation, and we have three moles of reactants, right? Two moles of SO2, one mole of O2. If you go moles of products minus moles of reactants, two minus three, you're going to get negative one, and that's what this exponent's always going to be. It's going to be the product moles minus the reactant moles, and we get negative one. I wrote in KEQ there because if you have any solids or liquids in your balanced equation, they do not appear in equilibrium constant expressions, so you would not count the moles of any solids or liquids, okay? But besides that, it's generally just moles of products minus moles of reactants. So this is actually the first algebraic expression you're going to need to know for Chem 1B. And that is, if you want to calculate a Kp for a given gaseous reaction, it will always equal the Kc of that gaseous reaction multiplied by Rt to the delta n power, where that delta n is what we just defined as the moles of products that appear in a KEQ expression minus the moles of reactants that appear in a KEQ expression. And we're only saying it that way because it's indicating you do not want to count moles of solids or liquids because they do not appear in equilibrium constant expressions. So if we have a reaction 2SO2 gas plus O2 gas is in equilibrium with 2SO3 gas, <clears throat> let's say the Kc for this reaction is 100 with a decimal point molar to the minus 1 at 27 degrees Celsius. Calculate Kp for this reaction. So we're going to use the yellow equation we have at the very top of the page here, and we're going to have to calculate what the delta n value is to plug into that equation. So you take the two moles of products minus the three moles of reactants, and that gives you a value for negative one, and so our delta n is going to be negative one. So we're going to take our Kc value of 100, and it's molarity to the minus one. Molarity is moles per liter, so molarity to the minus one will be liters per mole, so you'll see I'll write the units like that. So here's the expression we're going to use. The Kc is going to be 100 liters per mole. And then I've got in the yellow brackets R times T. So R is the universal gas constant, 0 0.08206 liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin. And the temperature was given as 27 degrees Celsius. Because our constant R has Kelvin in it, we'll have to switch the 27 degrees Celsius into Kelvin. And you do that by adding 273.2. So when you add 27 and 273.2, because 27 is only accurate to the ones place, and this is an addition problem, the answer actually is rounded to the ones place. So the correct answer with the proper number of significant figures would just be 300 with a decimal point. 
but I'm going to keep that two as a guard digit because I don't like rounding in the middle of longer calculations. So we're going to multiply the R and the T values together, raise them to the negative one power, and then multiply by 100 for the decimal point. That's going to wind, us giving, wind up giving us a three significant figure answer. In the units, the liters cancel out, the moles cancel out, the kelvins cancel out, and the only thing left over are atmospheres. But if you notice, the atmospheres are in the yellow brackets so that are raised to the negative one power. So that means the units are going to be atmospheres to the negative one. And the three significant figures, I get 4.06. And the units are atmospheres, as I said, to the negative one. Now, before we leave this problem, I want you to look back at the value for the KC that was given in the actual problem. It said the KC value is 100, and it said its units were molarity to the minus 1. We just calculated a KP value, and it was 4.06 atmospheres to the minus 1. So numerically, the two constants are different, and that should make sense. If you're going to do the ratio of molarities, that's not going to necessarily equal the ratio of pressures. They're wholly different things. But what is the same? is the units. The molarity is to the minus one, the atmospheres are to the minus one. Why are they the same? Where do they come from? They always equal delta n, so that's a little extra check you can do when you're doing your unit analysis there. The units for your kc or kp better have an exponent that's equal to whatever the delta n is for your chemical reaction. Let's try another one. Let's write the KC and KP expressions for the reaction NH4HS solid is in equilibrium with NH3 gas plus H2S gas. Here's a heterogeneous equilibrium, which means everything is not in the same state. We actually have ammonium bisulfide, the reactant, which is a solid. And as we learned last time, solids have constant concentrations. And because they're not variables, therefore, you don't put them in equilibrium constant expressions. So the KP expression for this reaction would be concentration of NH3 to the first, multiplied by concentration of H2S to the first, and then you're done. Because we don't put solids into the expressions, you would not have NH4HS solid in the denominator. That would be your KC expression. It's showing that the KC equals the product of molarities, because there's brackets. The KP expression is going to be the product of partial pressures, so the Kp will be the pressure of NH3 multiplied by the pressure of H2S. And once again, solids don't appear in the expressions. This would be your Kp expression. Let's try a calculation. Let's say the Kc for the above reaction is 0 0.10 molar to second power at 2 degrees Celsius. Calculate the Kp if you want to take a moment and try this on your own and then rejoin the lecture. In order to calculate what the Kp is going to be, we have to calculate delta N. And in this problem, we have two moles of products that are in the KEQ expressions, but we have no moles of reactants in the KEQ expressions because solids don't appear in equilibrium constant expressions. So the delta N, the change in moles for this reaction, would be 2 minus 0, not 2 minus 1, and therefore delta N is going to equal 2. So now we can plug in our Kc value of 0 0.10 molarity squared, which I'm going to write as mole squared per liter squared. And then we're going to multiply by R times T raised to the second power. So the Kc, 0 0.10 mole squared per liter squared, in the yellow brackets will be our R value, 0 0.08206 liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin. Two degrees Celsius, which to Kelvin would be two, plus 273.2, that would give you 275. The answer would actually round to the ones place because the two degrees Celsius is only accurate to the ones column. But I'm going to keep a guard digit, which I've colored green here in the middle of my calculation. So I'm entering it as 275.2. And then that's all going to be squared. If you square that and multiply by the KC, you'll actually have molarity squareds cancel out. You have liter squareds cancel out. You have Kelvin squareds cancel out. And what you'll have left over are liter squared over moles squared. And if, or rather, I'm sorry, you have um, just atmospheres left over. Sorry about that. The, the moles and the liters canceled out. We have atmospheres squared left over. And as two significant figure answer, we would get 51 atmospheres squared as the value for the Kp for this reaction. So for any reaction, if you're given a 
KC, you should be able to calculate a KP, and you should be able to go the other way around as well. For this reaction, 4HCl gas plus O2 gas is in equilibrium with 2Cl2 gas plus 2H2O liquid. If the KP for this reaction is 50 atmospheres to the negative 3 at 500 Kelvin, calculate its KC. So to go between KCs and KPs, we have to calculate the delta N for the reaction. Once again, remembering we do not include liquids and solids in our calculation for moles. So therefore, there's only two moles of gaseous products. There are five moles of gaseous reactants. Therefore, the delta N value is negative three. And if you look at the units for the KP that was given, notice what the exponent is, atmospheres to the negative three. Those had better match, otherwise somebody's made a mistake. So if we're going to calculate the Kc, because that's actually not on the left side of the equation, it's on the right, just a little bit more algebra for this, you would have to divide both sides of the equation by RT raised to the delta N power, and this is how we're going to calculate the Kc value. So we're going to plug in our Kp value of 50 atmospheres to the negative 3. In the denominator, we'll multiply R, 0 0.08206 liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin, by 500 Kelvin, the units were already correct and we're gonna raise that to the negative third power. <clears throat> so the calculation will look like this. You're actually gonna have the atmospheres to the negative three on the top cancel out with atmospheres to the negative three on the bottom. The Kelvins will cancel out, and you're gonna be left over with liters cubed over moles cubed. And because the 50 was only a two significant figure number, we're gonna get a two significant figure answer. So if you can practice to make sure you can do that in your calculator, you should get 3.5 times 10 to the sixth and the units come out to be liters cubed over moles cubed. Now, liters over moles is actually molarity to the minus one, and so liters cubed over moles cubed would be molarity to the minus three, and so if you wanted to simplify that, you could say 3.5 times 10 to the sixth molarity to the minus three. Once again, noticing that the exponent for the uh, units of the equilibrium constant always have to equal the delta N of the chemical reaction. If you want to try one more of these, 2HCl gas is in equilibrium with H2 gas plus Cl2 gas. If the Kc for the above reaction is 25 at 20 degrees Celsius, calculate the Kp. In this case, the moles of gaseous products is 2. The moles of gaseous reactants is 2 as well. So in this case, the delta N comes out to be 0. So now if we try to solve for our Kp value, We'll put the Kc value in of 25. It actually had no units. That was actually correct. It's not that I forgot them. R.08206. And then the temperature switched to Kelvin by adding 273.2 would be 293 with a guard digit of 0.2. And all that's raised to the zero power. Now, this really takes no work whatsoever. Anything raised to the zero power just equals one. So everything in the yellow brackets, that becomes one. The Kp is therefore 25 times 1, turns out to be 25. If you notice, whatever the units should theoretically be, either atmospheres or molarities, they would have to be raised to the power that equals delta n. That means raised to the power of 0, and anything raised to the power of 0 just equals 1, so that means the units don't appear. So if you actually have an, uh, an, a reaction where delta n is 0, then you're not going to have units for your equilibrium constants, and this will be the rare occasion when a Kp value and a Kc value will be identical to each other. Now, what we're going to work on next, <clears throat> probably the most fundamental concept this entire semester, so these next 10 minutes will probably be the most important, where if you understand what we do in the next 10 minutes, then a lot of stuff's going to be easier for you for the next few months, and if you don't, you got to go back and you got to look at this again because this is really an important concept in Chem 1B. We're going to try to calculate equilibrium data from non-equilibrium data, and let me tell you what I mean. Let's say we have a chemical reaction. This happens to be hydrogen gas plus iodine gas is in equilibrium with hydrogen iodide gas, and we know the equilibrium constant. One of the early experiments we're going to do this semester is to calculate experimentally an equilibrium constant. So there's lots of reactions that scientists have calculated these constants. They know what they are, and then we can use them theoretically as we're going to do in this problem here. So let's say we have a reaction. We know its equilibrium constant. 
And let's take a container and let's put just some hydrogen and iodine in the container and let it reach equilibrium. So let's say a tank is charged with, that means you add to it, enough hydrogen and iodide so that it becomes 0 0.200 atmospheres of hydrogen and 0 0.200 atmospheres of iodine. Find the equilibrium pressure of HI. So if this reaction reaches equilibrium, some of the hydrogen and iodine are going to react together to form some of the HI. We want to know how much HI is there going to be once equilibrium has been reached. Now, we did something similar to this in Chem 1A, and in fact, we even did something similar to this uh, in our first lecture, Lecture 1A. If we know how much hydrogen and iodine are in the container, and in this case, we're going to know it in terms of atmospheres instead of moles, so I'm going to do an initial change in final table in terms of atmospheres. We know the container is 0 0.200 atmospheres of hydrogen, 0 0.200 atmospheres of iodine, and no HI. And when you have gaseous reactions, it turns out mole ratios are the same as pressure ratios. And so therefore, the hydrogen and iodine are going to react in a one atmosphere to one atmosphere ratio. So if I want to figure out how much hydrogen would react away, I might assume all of it reacts away. And because hydrogen and iodine are in a one to one ratio, you would have to react away 0 0.200 atmospheres of iodine. And then the amount of HI that would be formed, because it's now a 1 to 2 ratio, would be 0 0.400. If we add up the columns, that means we would have no hydrogen, no iodine, and we would have 0 0.400 atmospheres of HI in the container. And this would be the answer to the question if the reaction went to completion. But this reaction does not go to completion. How do we know that? because it has an equilibrium constant. If a reaction has an equilibrium constant, the reaction reaches equilibrium. You're going to wind up having some hydrogen and some iodine and some HI all in the container when equilibrium is reached. If a reaction actually does go to completion, you're not going to be given an equilibrium constant because there won't be one. So because an equilibrium constant is given, you do not do an ICF table and figure out what would be the amount of product produced assuming all of the reactants react away as much as possible. We have to do this a little bit differently because the reaction reaches equilibrium. Here's how we do it. We're going to do an initial atmosphere line, then we're gonna do change in atmospheres, and then the final lines can be our equilibrium atmospheres instead of our final atmospheres. They're really the same thing, but we're just emphasizing that it's reaching equilibrium. And that makes a really cute little thing here, initial change equilibrium, ICE. These are sometimes called ice tables. So if the reaction goes to completion, we know 0 0.200 atmospheres of the H2 reacts. But if it goes to equilibrium, we don't know how much reacts. So back in junior high school, when you first took algebra, if you don't know how much of something is going to be for a particular property, what do you do? You give it a variable. So I'm going to give this a variable. I'm going to say it's not negative 0 0.200 that's changing. I'm going to say x is changing. I'm going to write minus x under the H2. That's going to represent how much hydrogen reacts away so that the reaction reaches equilibrium. That's algebra. Here's the chemistry part. If x amount of H2 gas reacts away, how much I2 would react away has to be the ratio of the coefficients in the balanced equation. It would have to be the exact same number. So these ratios have to come from the balanced equation. If it's 1x of hydrogen reacting away, it's going to be 1x of iodine reacting away. And how much hydrogen iodide do you think is going to be produced? You're going to produce, it's got to be a 1 to 2 ratio, 2x. That's the most important concept of this entire semester for you to see where that came from. In any change line for a reaction that reaches equilibrium, we're going to use x's. And we're always going to use an x preceded with the coefficient in the balanced equation. So what I've really written here under the hydrogen is minus 1x. I wrote under the iodine minus 1x. And then I'm forming the product. So that's why that's going to be a positive value. It's positive 2x. If you understood that, then the rest won't be too bad. I just now add up the columns to see how much of each of these substances you'll have at equilibrium. 0 0.200 minus x is 0 0.200 minus x. Same thing for the iodine, 0 0.200 minus x. And the HI is 0 plus 2x, which just simplifies to 2x. 
So these are the equilibrium pressures on this bottom line here. Those can be placed into an equilibrium constant expression and their ratio of products to reactants has to equal the equilibrium constant. Not the initial pressures, those are not equilibrium values. It's the equilibrium atmospheres whose ratio is gonna equal the equilibrium constant. So what is the equilibrium constant expression for this reaction? Because we're dealing with pressures, it's gonna be the pressure of HI gas squared divided by the pressure of H2 gas multiplied by the pressure of I2 gas. I know the numerical value of the equilibrium constant. It's 36.0. Notice it doesn't have any units. That's because delta N in this reaction is zero. I now plug in the equilibrium atmospheres for all of the reactants and products. So see if this makes sense to you. It's 36.0 equals the pressure of HI at equilibrium is 2X. I have to square it. And then in the denominator, the pressure of H2 at equilibrium is 0.200 minus X and the pressure of I2 at equilibrium is 0.200 minus X. So I just simplified that and just wrote it 0.200 minus X squared. Now we're gonna do some algebra and we're gonna to try to solve that for X. Now, sometimes these are easy, sometimes they're more challenging. This one happens to be an easier one because the right side of the equation, that big complex side, happens to be a perfect square, which means if I take the square root of both sides of this equation, the right side will simplify to be just the square root of the numerator, which is 2x, over the square root of the denominator, which is 0 0.200 minus x. The left side doesn't have to be a perfect square, but it just happens to be in this case, so we could actually do it in our head. So if you take the square root of both sides, the square root of 36 is 6, and then the square root of the right side becomes, as I said, 2x over 0 0.200 minus x. And now a little bit of algebra to try to solve this for x. I'm going to multiply both sides of the equation by the denominator of the right side. Multiply both sides by 0 0.200 minus x. They'll cancel out on the right side, and the 0 0.200 minus x will now have to be multiplied by 6. I will now distribute the left side of the equation. 6.00 multiplied by 0 0.200 will give me a three significant figure number, and then 6.00 multiplied by negative x will give me a three significant figure number. So those become 1.20 minus 6.00x equals the exact 2x. That two there was not a measured number, so it's considered to be exact. Now, I wanna move all the x terms to one side of the equation, so I'm gonna add 6.00x to both sides. The 6.00x has 6.00 .00 accurate two places past the decimal point. The two is an exact number, so it technically goes an infinite number of places past the decimal point. So when I add the six and the two, I actually get 8.00x, and that equals 1.20. Divide both sides by 8.00. I'm then going 1.20 divided by 8.00, both three significant figure numbers. So x will come out three significant figures, and we're able to calculate what x would theoretically be when the reaction reaches equilibrium. It comes out 0.150. That was a lot of work and a lot of times we stop and congratulate ourselves for doing that, but you gotta look at the problem. This is not what it was asking. It didn't say what's the value of X when you reach equilibrium. It says what's the equilibrium pressure of HI? So you have to go back to your ice table, look under HI and go down to where it said equilibrium atmospheres. What's the equilibrium pressure of HI in this particular setup? Well, it equaled 2X. So the way we get the answer to the problem is we go two multiplied by 0 0.150 atmospheres. And so we would predict theoretically without, without ever having done the reaction, that if we started a container with 0 0.200 atmospheres of hydrogen and 0 0.200 atmospheres of iodine, let it go to equilibrium, we would wind up having at equilibrium 0 0.300 atmospheres of hydrogen iodide. And that concept I wanna practice a couple of more times today before we're done because that's really the most important thing that we're gonna be doing for the next several months in Chem 1B, you understanding how you determine equilibrium values starting with systems that are not at equilibrium. Let's try this. PF5 gas is in equilibrium with PF3 gas plus F2 gas. And let's say the equilibrium constant, the KP for this reaction has been determined experimentally to be 15.0. I probably should have written the units on that. Quite often, uh, units are not written with equilibrium constants just to save space, which is really unfortunate, but the actual units for this would be atmospheres to the, to the first power if we wrote them in there. 
So if a tank is initially charged with only 0 0.200 atmospheres of PF5, find the equilibrium pressure of PF5. So the PF5 is going to react away, it's going to reach equilibrium, and you're going to have some value less than 0 0.200 that's in the container once equilibrium has been reached. If the reaction went to completion, we would have no PF5 left in there, but this is not a reaction that goes to completion because there's an equilibrium constant. So if we write the reaction, I'm going to do an ice table for this. And because it's dealing with pressures, I'm going to do initial atmospheres, change in atmospheres, and equilibrium atmospheres. What did they say was in the tank? They said 0 0.200 atmospheres of PF5. If they don't say anything else, then you can assume that everything else is zero. So they won't necessarily say that specifically, but if they leave something out and don't mention it, you can assume that it's not in the container. Now, an important thing about uh, an ice table is that when you have your initial values, you've got to figure out, is the reaction proceeding to the left or to the right? And if you ever have only reactants and you have no products, the only reaction that can occur is the forward reaction. So this problem, like the one before, we're only given reactants. The only thing that can happen is the PF5 pressure will go down. So it's got to subtract away the amount that changes. On the product side, which are the PF3 and the F2, they're going to be formed because they're products, so they're going to be pluses. And I'm going to use in my change line the variable x for indicating how much reacts to get to equilibrium. I'm going to multiply the x's by the coefficients in the balanced equation. So the change in PF5 is going to be minus 1x. The change in atmospheres for PF3 is going to be plus 1x. And the change in pressure for the F2 is going to be plus 1x. This was a simple one. All the coefficients were 1. But the unimportant thing in this problem is to recognize when you put minuses and when you put pluses. If you know the reactions proceeding to the right, then all the products will be pluses and the reactants have to be minuses add up the columns, the equilibrium pressure of PF5 will be 0 0.200 minus x, and the equilibrium pressures for PF3 and F2 will both be x. Now these equilibrium pressures are related to the equilibrium constant. The ratio of the products to the reactants is going to equal the equilibrium constant, so you want to actually, after an ice table, always write your equilibrium constant expression. So that's going to be the partial pressure of PF3 multiply by the partial pressure of F2, divided by the partial pressure of PF5. And once you have the expression written, we make sure we have all the coefficients and the superscripts written correctly. Now we're going to plug the values in. The Kp is 15.0, and 15.0 has to equal the ratio of the equilibrium pressures of the products to the equilibrium pressures of the reactants. That's why we go to the equilibrium line in the ice table, and we use the values from there. So the 15.0 equal x times x on the top, or x squared, divided by 0.200 minus x. And now we just have to work some algebra to solve this for x. Now in this case, the right side of the equation is not a perfect square. The numerator is, but the denominator is not, because it doesn't say 0.200 minus x quantity squared. So we're going to have to rearrange this now, solve it for 0, and then try to arrange it in descending powers of x. So I'm going to multiply both sides by 0 0.200 minus x, so they'll cancel out on the right side, and the 0 0.200 minus x will appear on the left. Distributive property, 0 0.200 multiplied by 15.0, and negative x multiplied by 15.0. Both of those will be three significant figure numbers, so it turns out to be 3.00 minus 15.0x, and that equals x squared. When you're trying to solve a second order equation, you actually want to move all the terms to one side of the equation, so you set it equal to zero. So I'm going to add 15.0x to both sides, and I'm going to subtract 3.00 from both sides, so I actually have a zero on the left side of the equation. If I do that, zero will equal x squared plus 15.0x minus 3.00. And when you have a second order equation or quadratic in this form, you have three choices as, have, as to how to solve it. You can do it by factoring, you can do it by completing the square, or you can do it by the quadratic equation. Any one of those is fine, whatever is the easiest for you, but in most situations, the best way to do this is with the quadratic equation, which you may remember is negative b, where b is the coefficient in front of the x term, so that would be negative 15.0 
plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac, a is the coefficient in front of the x squared, which is 1, c is the coefficient without any x term, that's the negative 3.00, and it's all going to be divided by 2 times a. So to do the quadratic equation, it's negative 15.0 plus or minus the square root of 15.0 squared minus 4 times 1 times negative 3.00, all divided by 2 times 1. So that's negative b plus or minus b squared minus 4ac over 2a. Because this is a quadratic, you're going to get two answers. One of the answers is going to be between 0 and 0 0.200. And that's going to be the correct answer. You're starting with 0 0.200 atmospheres of PF5. Some of it's going to react away. It can't go any lower than zero. So the correct answer has to be between 0 0.200 and zero. You'll have a second answer. It will be outside that range, which mathematically will be correct, but it doesn't apply to the real world, to this particular situation. So we call that an extraneous route. So once you get your two answers, you pick the one answer that fits between zero and 0.200 and that came out 0.197. So this is a little bit more challenging, but we can still calculate what x would be. And then we go to the question one more time and go, what did it ask for? It asked for the equilibrium pressure of PF5. So look in your ice table under the PF5, it's the reactant in this case. And down under where it says equilibrium atmospheres, it says the pressure of PF5 at equilibrium is 0 0.200 minus x. So now that we know what x is, we go 0 0.200 atmospheres minus 0.197 atmospheres, subtraction problem. When you do subtraction, you look at columns past the decimal point. 0 0.200 goes three places past the decimal point. 0.197 goes three places past the decimal point. Your answer has to be rounded to three places past the decimal point, therefore 0 0.003 atmospheres. Yes, you've lost a couple of significant figures, but that's how you get the right answer in terms of addition or subtraction problems. If you wanted to write that as a three significant figure answer, 0 0.00300, you'd be applying the rule for multiplying or dividing, which we're not doing in this case. So the end point anyway for this one is that if you know the equilibrium constant and you can do a little algebra, you can actually calculate what the theoretical pressure of the PF5 is going to be if the system reaches equilibrium even though you haven't done the problem. Let me add a part B to this, okay? Let me ask you, what is the percent dissociation of PF5? So what exactly does that mean, okay? Percent dissociation <clears throat> means how much of the PF5 reacted away. And if we look back at our ice table from before, just so we can uh, see what I'm talking about, we started with 0 0.200 atmospheres of PF5. The amount that dissociates is what changes. So look directly under the PF5's initial atmospheres and its change in atmospheres, and it says minus x. The minus isn't important, that just means it's reacting away, but x is the amount that reacts away or dissociates. So percent dissociation is the amount that dissociates, which is gonna be x, divided by the original amount, which is 0 0.200 atmospheres, that'll give you a fraction, and then if you multiply it by 100, that'll give you a percent. So from the ice table, you should be able to do this. This is going to be x divided by 0 0.200 atmospheres. It's the change divided by the initial, multiplied by 100. And because we've already calculated what x was, that means the percent dissociation is going to be 0 0.197 atmospheres divided by 0 0.200 atmospheres, multiplied by 100. Now, this is a division and multiplication problem. The 100 is an exact number, so we don't use that for significant figure determination. But I'm dividing two, three significant figure numbers by each other, so the answer will come out three significant figures, and I get 98.5% dissociated. Let's try one more calculation involving uh, using an equilibrium constant to calculate equilibrium data. Let's take the reaction H2 gas plus Cl2 gas is in equilibrium with 2HCl gas. And we'll say experimentally that the Kc for this reaction has been determined to be 75. <clears throat> if 0 0.10 moles of HCl are placed in a 2.0 liter flask, what will be the concentration of the HCl at equilibrium? So when you're reading these problems, you're trying to get what the equilibrium concentration of HCl is going to be. Anytime you're asking for equilibrium data, you're probably going to have to do an ice table. 
And you're definitely going to have to do an ice table if the numerical data given to you is non-equilibrium data. They said 0 0.10 moles of HCl are just placed in a 2.0 liter flask. So that's not equilibrium. The reaction has to occur. In this case, the reverse reaction is going to occur. The HCl is going to turn into hydrogen and chlorine and eventually equilibrium will be reached. So for us to do a calculation like this, it's going to require an ice table. In this case, the equilibrium constant is a Kc. And what is a Kc a ratio of? Molarities of products to molarities of reactants. So that means we don't use the 0 0.10 moles of HCl. That's not a molarity. We'll have to calculate its molarity. So the initial molarity of the HCl is going to be the 0 0.10 moles divided by the 2.0 liters. This will give you a two significant figure answer for the molarity. So we're starting with a container where the HCl is 0 0.050 molar. Now, if you know the equilibrium constant for the reaction written as a composition reaction, element plus element yields compound, that's what's written, hydrogen plus chlorine yields HCl, write the reaction exactly how you know it so that it equals the equilibrium constant. If we're gonna do an ice table for this, in this case, you don't have any hydrogen to start with. You don't have any chlorine to start with. You're starting with the HCl. There's no problem with starting with a problem like this. It's more common that you're given the reactants and then you'll have no products to start, but you can actually start with products and have no reactants. That's perfectly fine. If that really bothers you and you don't like it, you can do two things. You can reverse the reaction. So it becomes 2HCl yields hydrogen plus chlorine. But then what do you have to do to the equilibrium constant if you reverse a reaction? you have to take the reciprocal of it. So if you reverse the reaction, take the reciprocal, then you'd have the 0 0.050 on the left side, and then both zeros on the right side, that would be perfectly fine. But it's not necessary to do. Now, if you only have products present, which we do in this case, the only reaction that can occur is the reverse reaction. So that means the HCl is gonna react away, and so what you put under the HCl is gonna be negative values of X. You're forming hydrogen and chlorine, so because you're forming them, you're going to put positive values for X. So you're going to form plus 1X of hydrogen, you're going to form plus 1X of chlorine, and you're going to react away 2X of HCl, so we go minus 2X. Add the columns, we get X, X, and then this last one will be 0 0.050 minus 2X. So a little bit different, but still it's conceptually the same thing. Once you've completed an ice table, then we write the equilibrium constant expression and its products over reactants and the HCl is on the right side of your equation, so that's your product. So you go the concentration of HCl squared divided by the concentration of H2 times the concentration of Cl2, and then we put in the equilibrium constant, the Kc, which was 75, and that's going to equal the ratio of the equilibrium molarities so that's going to be 0 0.050 minus 2x quantity squared divided by x times x, which I'll just simplify as x squared. And now we do the algebra to solve this. <clears throat> In this case, the right side of the equation is a perfect square. So this will be a problem where we don't have to use the quadratic equation. I'm just going to take the square root of both sides. So take the square root of 75, that comes out 8.66 and take the square root of the right side, which just becomes in the numerator, 0 0.050 minus 2x, and the denominator, x. So now we've taken the square root of both sides. We only have x to the first power. To solve this now, I'm going to first multiply both sides by x. I'm clearing the denominator is what I'm really doing. So multiply both sides by x. The x cancels out on the right side, and the left side now becomes 8.66x. I want to collect all my x terms, so I'm going to move my negative 2x from the right side to the left side by adding 2x to each side. So 8.66x plus 2x will be 10.66x, and that's going to equal 0 0.050. Now divide both sides by 10.66, and you'll have your value for x. The 0.050 is only a two significant figure number, so the answer would actually only be two significant figures. So technically, it'd be 0 0.0047 but because I haven't calculated the final answer to the question yet, I'm not gonna round it to the right number of significant figures yet. I'm gonna keep at least one guard digit. You can keep all the digits in your calculator if you want, that actually would be better, but at least keep one. So I'm gonna write down 0 0.00469, color it green so I know it's a guard digit. 
So the question said, what's going to be the equilibrium concentration of the HCl? So go to your ice table, look under HCl, go down to its equilibrium molarity, and what did it say at equilibrium? It said it's going to be 0 0.050 minus 2x, and so you're going to go 0 0.050 minus 2 multiplied by 0 0.00469. Now, when you go two times 0 0.00469, you're gonna get approximately 0 0.0093, and that goes three places, that goes actually four places past the decimal point. The 0 0.050 only goes three places past the decimal point, so because it's a subtraction problem, your answer is gonna be rounded to three places past the decimal point, and so the correct answer for the equilibrium pressure of, uh, of molarity, rather, of uh, HCl, will be 0 0.041 molar. Let's uh, put a final part B onto this. What is going to be the percent dissociation of HCl? And to do this, you have to go back and you have to look at your ice table. Percent dissociation is the amount of the HCl that reacts away. So that's what's under the HCl in the change line divided by the original amount of HCl. That's in the initial line. So the percent dissociation is going to be how much the changes, and if you look at your ice table, that should say minus 2x. So the minus just means it reacts away. All we need is the 2x part of that. And the original amount is what's in the initial line. That's 0 0.050 molar. So the percent dissociation will be 2x over 0 0.050 molar multiplied by 100. We know the value for x. That's 0 0.00. I probably should have put 469 there, so sorry about that. But I have 0 0.0047. Calculate the numerator, divide it by 0 0.050, multiply by 100, and you will get a two significant figure answer of 19% as the percent dissociation.